You're tuned into the Zealous Podcast. I'm your host, Rocky Snyder, and this week I've got Jeff Ruiz on the show. Now, that may be a familiar name. In fact, he's been on the Zealous Podcast before when he was the director of rehabilitation for the Washington Commanders. That's right, NFL. But nowadays, well, he went to his hometown of Miami, got hired as the senior director of rehabilitation for the Miami Heat. So we're going to talk all about transitioning from the NFL to the NBA and a whole bunch more. But before we get started, remember, so Tanta College is a place you can go for your master's degree of science, whether it's performance coaching or maybe it's sports injury and return to performance management. They've got courses in applied sports biomechanics and movement science, as well as applied sport and exercise psychology. If you go to SatantaCollege.com, enter the code RS10, you'll get 10% off your tuition today. SatantaCollege.com. Meanwhile, if you're looking for continuing education workshops and maybe you're part of a sports team, with medical and training staff. Well, if you go to RockySnyder.com, we've got courses lined up where we can come to you and you get CEU credits for your chiropractor, your athletic trainer, your physical therapist and strength coach. Just go to RockySnyder.com and check that out. And while you're online, go to NSCA.com, cast your vote. There's ballots open for members and there's one in particular for the board of directors I'm kind of interested in you voting for. Meanwhile, follow us on Instagram at Rocky underscore Snyder Click the subscribe button and enjoy the show. Jeff, I, I've been so excited. I mean, we've had this on the docket for a while now, and and here's the day where we can actually sit down and chat. I mean, what a hell of a season you guys ran. First, uh, just officially welcome back to the Zealous Podcast. Hey, thank you. I appreciate it, Rocky. I've been uh, keeping up with you for a while, and I'm ecstatic to be back on. Thanks for having oh, me. Oh, well. It's mutual, brother, because last time you were on, you were in a completely different situation. Washington Commanders, director of rehabilitation up there, and then um, you you go on home. You're a Miami boy, went to the University of Miami, grew up watching the Heat, and now you're sitting as the director of rehabilitation for the Miami Heat. First of all, what's what's that like? Uh, it's it's uh, a blessing, to say the least. I mean, I'm very fortunate to be back home. Um, it was a whirlwind of a, of a situation, just <laughs> leaving a team um, in, in the middle of the season and going to another team just to start off training camp, stuff like that. So that was that was interesting. But being able to go back home and get to an organization that I've that I've loved and admired for so many years is it's, it's definitely a blessing. Sure. Was was that on your your goal board by chance? Did you have this like on your vision board at all? I'm going to be director of rehab for the Heat. Honestly, it was. Yeah, it was. Was it? Yeah, it was. It was um, it was something that I was like, you know, I I liked the aspect of basketball. Um, I liked. I had worked basketball some in college. Um, I worked honestly a lot more women's basketball than men's, and I I helped with men's, but I was. I was like always very passionate about it. I loved it. I played some basketball growing up, but nothing crazy. I was, I was definitely nothing to, to talk about in basketball at all. But um, I always enjoyed the sport, and then I liked the, the dynamics of it. Um, in the sense that there's a lot less people, and you can spend a lot more time, and just you can get a lot of impact with, with uh, like the one-on-one -on -one care, etc. Sorry for the for the screaming in the background. I got my one year old over there in the other. Oh, room. oh, that's great though. So not only do you get to have a great place, you've got a one year old. And I imagine your family's nearby, seeing you grew up there. So you've got some good family support while you're doing this too. Oh yeah, yeah. So that was that was part of the the whole whirlwind. That it was a uh, it was amazing for them to to be able to go ahead and experience, you know like having family close nearby and we weren't ex I wasn't expecting the move at all like I wasn't expecting this it was just something that I was like hey you know like I had known the people from the heat and I was like hey that's obviously a tremendous organization and uh like my my boss I know him and I I I was always you know lord to the situation I I absolutely liked it and it was just came to fruition so yeah, yeah how how did it if you don't mind sharing a little bit like because uh, you're you're sitting pretty nice to the commanders and then suddenly this opportunity kind of did it just land in your on your lap or how did it happen um I mean honestly they they had an opening and um I was 
I was contacted. That was just, I mean, it's it's not a very crazy story or anything. There was there was an opening and I, I was contacted about it. Uh I've known different people throughout the throughout the the league and like from the NBA to uh from college and it kind of just matched into that and my my boss uh, gave me a call and the rest is kind of just history I flew down there and the the commanders were very supportive of it so it was it was a uh, something that yeah I mean I loved my situation honestly there in Washington and it was it was a great situation I I, I worked with tremendous people tr like and I have nothing bad to say at all it was just something that like it was an opportunity that that I couldn't pass up for sure. Fantastic though. I mean, and to have that kind of, again, like as a goal and I just, I love those long range goals that get acquired. It's just, I love just learning all about it and like what had to happen for that to occur. And well, you just keep your doors of opportunity wide open and, and you're, you're always alert to changes and you keep your foot in the door wherever you can go so that it's no surprise things like this happen. So I want to know like growing pains though, going from, a 64 64 man roster isn't that what the NFL is there basically uh, yeah more? when you have when you account for the for the P squad for the practice squad it would be uh I think it's 16 now post covid so it's 52 wow. plus 16 so 68 so it's a lot it's and, a lot of and mm -hmm. so what were the growing pains like going from the commanders to the heat like we you were i'm sure just learning completely under fire the entire time for a while yeah for sure it was a like I think that like the sport in itself wasn't necessarily new to me however the NBA was for sure like I had done basketball at a at a level in in the NCAA which it was just very different very like the amount of the amount of games the amount of travel um the travel is honestly what what truly uh like was the biggest, the biggest learning curve, you know, um, like you, you're gone. You could have like somebody in an NBA organization could be having a road trip that's accounted for almost two weeks, you know? So as yeah. opposed to NFL, you're a day in a day out boom, and coming on back. So in that regard, it was different. It was much different for sure. And I imagine mama and the baby stayed home most of the time. Yeah. That'd be really hard to travel. Mm -hmm. But you've got family to support. So that's like, I believe it coming over and helping out whenever you can or whatever, right? Absolutely. So I have I have family here. She has a lot of family here. It was it was lucky. Rocky, <sighs> do you need me to tell to step to another room? I can't hear it. No, Wait, we're good. All right, perfect. No. perfect. Um, yeah. I, okay, so when it comes to, oh, let's just go right into director of rehab. How is your role as director of rehabilitation for the commanders differed from director of rehabilitation for Miami Heat? So, I mean, there's very similar principles in, in a yeah. lot of work, you know, um, just from uh, overall kind of looking at how the injury is going to affect the layout of participation, et cetera. Um, as well as obviously instituting the care and then like a lot of preventative work. So I work hand in hand with a lot of the staffs, you know, I mean, uh, I work from in the sense of obviously I'm with athletic trainers uh, as well as also I'm with the strength coaches too. So in that regards, um, I'm definitely uh, still doing very similar stuff. It's just, I would say the management is, there, there are so many more games to account for that that participation might might vary a lot more. I'll say with the with that organization, uh, I'm I'm still finishing up my PhD, so everybody's been very supportive with allowing me to kind of explore certain things with that. So that helps, you know, just doing stuff, uh, trying to be proactive on on injury prevention and everything like that. So, yeah. That's and it's little... common injury sites will vary also, right? So with the NBA players, you're looking at ankle issues, low back. Uh, I can imagine probably groin. Are those the three big buckets for you? Yeah, so ankle issues, definitely low back. Uh, groin, 
you know, some type of soft tissue, whatever it might be, and then just contact contact based based injuries, you know, whatever it might be. You know, there's always there's always something that like with the NBA, like it's still it's still considered a contact sport for sure. It's not a necessarily a 22 mile per hour deliberate collision, but it's it's a uh, you know, there's a lot of collisions and a lot of impacts. So there's a lot of that that can go along too, for sure. And this season, what was your biggest challenge? This season, I would probably say getting my legs up underneath myself in the sense of saying like recognizing like I I needed to to pace myself probably like I had come from from a training camp in the NFL and uh, then going like directly through the season into another training camp. And then usually like the the season would be done in January, February and like ours ended in May. So it's it was a little bit longer of a stretch. So trying to make sure that I was I was being healthy, like with my own personal uh like awareness and development like making sure I was still working out a lot making sure I was eating right trying to get the proper sleep because you know sleep schedules are so erratic with with an NBA schedule so trying to do stuff that would be uh honestly like the healthiest thing for me was was probably the biggest challenge um because you can get caught in the grind and not necessarily looking at everything uh like um like that oh I'm gonna have to do this for several more months like I can't sustain this if I'm if I'm just kind of doing everything and then trying to balance school as well and a one year old so it was it was a it was more of my own personal stuff to try to to try to stay on top of than than anything with like the organization or anything like that. And was it you exclusively that came down from the commanders, or did you grab a couple of your mates that you were working with there and say hey? come with me. I need to form this team or were they just, there was one opening and you slid in and then you had to get accustomed to all the team members that were there. Exactly that. It was uh, just me, myself. It was just me, myself that uh, I did not bring anybody with me, but yeah, I mean, the, the team that, that I'm on is, is amazing. Like they, they were, it was very easy to go ahead and hit the ground running for sure. They have been tremendous. So welcoming open it was kind of easy buy-in absolutely absolutely fantastic no, it is wow definitely like a, a dream a dream position for sure and, and what what are you going for your phd what's the actual discipline that you're studying right now uh, it's kinesiology but like primarily like sports science so uh yeah i'm i'm not i'm not doing any research on any players or anything like that i'm doing it separate uh but yeah, I'm looking at uh, dynamic strength indices and to see if flywheel is going to be a viable, uh, viable option or a viable intervention to go ahead and see if it can uh, change change anything with that. So yeah, uh, flywheel in regards to offsetting plyometric training, explosive training. Is that where you're going? Yeah, pretty much. So exactly that. That's where I want to try to see if uh, flywheel training can go ahead and actually cause somebody to have a shift within the dynamic strength index to see if like their needs are more maximal strength concurrent or ballistic and then if the flywheel can actually cause enough of a stimulus to to actually change where they're at or make drastic improvements or nothing and it's kind of where where i'm at just trying to see if it would be a, a good intervention to try to see if somebody is in the ballistic needs category or something like that that Maybe instead of a lot of contacts or jumps, maybe they can substitute some with, with plyometric or with a uh, flywheel training. And you determine that by um, VBT force plate. Is that how you're yeah. assessing it? Yeah, force plate testing primarily. So it'd be the isometric mid thigh pull, um, and then the counter movement jump. So and then the ratio with that. So just trying to see, basically. Um, like where if somebody's falling along that 0. 0.6 to or below a 0. 0.6 then you know that they're going to need the ballistic needs if it's 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8 then it'll be concurrent training and if it's more than that then you know that they're going to be needing for more maximal strength so it's just something that i found that was interesting and uh i've been playing with force plates for the last two jobs that i was at and uh that's something that I, I use in my in my daily life or in my like 
as part of my practice anyways. And uh, I wanted to continue to kind of learn more and more about it. And then flywheel training has always been something that has seriously interested me. Um, uh, training in general, you know, like obviously has always interested me, but like flywheel and iso inertial training, everything like that was something that I thought was uh, the like an intervention that I wanted to explore further too. So kind of just combine the two, and I was like, how how effective can this actually be with an intervention? You know, so and where are you on the timeline? Like, are you still in the research gathering? Yeah, or yeah. are you yeah yeah so I'll be, I'll be gathering research soon uh and get an irb approval hopefully soon so yeah and what so, school are you using for your phd where are you going concordia st paul all right so then you're you're basically online with most of your yeah. courses yeah and it's no self-paced or is it live stuff that you have uh, to do i mean you could pace it yourself, but it's, I mean, they, they try to keep you along a curriculum and sure. I, uh, you set up everything and it's been, I have hopefully about a year left, about a year. So, wow. so yeah, yeah I, I feel your pain, man. I, I don't have a little one at home, but I've got a business. I've got two older kids and a wife and, uh, and I'm, I'm halfway through my master's in sports injury and return to performance management. And I'm just going, Oh man, this is, uh, and it's along the same lines. It's not self-paced. They kind of move you along with one learning module after another. And there's certain landmarks you have to make and you have to do a capstone at the end, but there's continuous assessment projects with every module. And like, I don't know. So sleep, I guess we're both in the same boat. Three hours a night. Is that, a, is that okay yeah. to get? Is that what we're talking? No, how many that's... nights, is, how many hours of sleep do you get? <laughs> Probably about like five, six, maybe, maybe. <laughs> But no, I try to I try to stack it up as much as I can at certain times. But yeah, just about that. Oh. How about yourself? Where are you Where are you studying in it? I'm with Satanta College, actually not far from you, and okay. based in Florida, and then Dublin, Ireland. It's been a good program. I've really enjoyed it. And you know, uh, having a bachelor's in English literature doesn't look as good on the resume when I'm trying to work with guys like you and yeah. uh, and your staff and all that. Like, uh, yeah, UMass English. Yeah, that's that's another way of saying bong puller, I guess, in some worlds. <laughs> but anyway, we'll get back into your world. How about that? Um, I'm not. We don't mention players in here. We give everybody their their um, freedom and and uh, independence, and and that's the last thing I want to do is pry into the lives of other people, except yeah. for the guests that I have right in front of me. But you you had some injuries, just like any other team, just and um, some greater than the others. Take me along for the ride when it comes to rehab and return to performance management, seeing that I'm, I'm studying it right now. Give me give me the ins and outs of how your system works. Like, is it is it somewhat, I won't say rudimentary, is it the same as everybody else? Or do you have some other things that you'd like to throw in there? Yeah, so, I mean, for the last, for the last several years, uh, th so this isn't anything specific to the organization that I'm at now. This is something that kind of carried through for a while. Uh, everything when I'm moving forward has to be kind of criterion based and the people need to go ahead and be reconditioned as soon as possible. You know, so trying to make sure that uh, all the staff that that I'm working with has a hand in it as well. So like, I recognize that it takes a village. And the fact of the matter is, like, I'm making sure that everybody is, is uh, I might be driving a rehab at that point, um, but everybody has kind of some skin in the game and is going to also help that person kind of return back to. So when I say that, um, like, trying to make sure that they're getting reconditioned as soon as possible, like, whatever it might be, uh, they would be doing something to try to get their heart rate, like, up and their wind up as soon as they can just so just starting to try to help optimize what they're going to be able to go ahead and and tolerate as far as like at a higher harder capacity from the get um but then like the criterion based progressions and everything that i would say uh it's definitely not something that i would say is foreign to a lot of people but i try to use as many different technologies that i feel are actually like valid for the situation but also using my own eye and clinical judgment as well. 
So whether that's force plates, other different types of dynamometers, as well as also, um, you know, GPS and everything like that to try to see that if certain people were hitting certain metrics, then I would feel safer with them going ahead and progressing to the next step. So it's not as much timeline based, but more criterion based. And that's not something that's novel, but the way that, that I like to kind of take a spin at, at it as is, is like making sure that uh, they're lifting usually very heavy. If somebody's with me or in, in a rehab, they're gonna go ahead and strain a decent amount to help prep them. If they're not doing as much dynamic stuff, it can help accelerate their ability to get to dynamic. So when I say very heavy, I mean, obviously they're straining and putting forth enough effort to where I feel that they're gonna have the capacity and the ceiling to actually achieve something a little bit more dynamic in a much uh, faster fashion. You know, so do you so, have like a minimal percentage of one RM for most lifts, like 75 or 80 and above, or what are we talking? 65? Where's, where's your low ceiling and where's your, where's your top off? So it depends on the goal of the day and the week and, and all okay. and what they're kind of looking like. So a lot of the time it would be a heavier load uh, to where, you know, like it might be something to where they're actually at like 70, 70% of their RM or something, or what would be relative to them at that time. You know, obviously if they're injured, then you have to go ahead and scale it back significantly, but making sure that at that relative capacity, I'll be having them strain at about 70 and then maybe pu pushing it up to 80, 85 on certain days. But then like, it's not always going to be strictly linear to where like, oh, we're just going to go ahead and start with 12 to 15 and then strip down, strip down, strip down. However, uh, there's nothing wrong with that model. Just with me, there's certain days that I might have them go a little bit harder and getting up to, you know, maybe four or five reps and actually straining with serious compound movements that might be biased towards a unilateral approach for quite some time. And then once I feel things have started to even out, that's when I usually incorporate a lot more of a bilateral movement approach and then start to actually put down some some good uh like work and and uh strain while they're in those compound movements at that time and kind of incorporate uh a little bit more dynamic effort uh work to prep them for more d cell and more or more like ballistic functions at that time so it'll all be kind of derivatives of a lot of these different compound movements or lifts or something like that and while also making sure that we're addressing, you know, uh, obviously joint integrity, nutrition, um, and uh, like overall, overall range, et cetera. Like those are the prerequisites that will allow you to progress past. So and, not trying and to like at that stage, do you integrate like uh, soft tissue or joint mobilization in between the lifts? Do you like, okay, we're gonna do this lift. I'm gonna put you on the table. We're gonna work here. And then I want you to go load again. Are you playing back and forth like that at all? Yeah, sometimes, definitely. That's uh, specifically, like I would say a lot of time when I'll do that is when I'm having a lot more joint restrictions or something like that. Like a lot more like issues with range, like might almost be like a test retest or something at that point. Um, to where I'm like, okay, let's go ahead and do this, see how they're moving. Let's get a little bit of a load. And then you're going to get some manual. Then you're going to get a little bit more of a load. I'll definitely do that. A lot of the time um, before, I'll probably have them start with some type of like active warm up, whatever it might be, get a lot of perfusion to the tissue. Then I'll put them to, to do a little bit more like range, let's say like active assisted range, however it might be. Um, and then start to try to strengthen. Then I might actually work on a little bit more range at that time and then go forth and really start to move and start to get build into like working sets of what I want to actually get towards. And I think- and you, that, Go ahead, sorry. Um, no, no, no. So I would say uh, with a lot of the movements that I'm going to be doing, like with, with somebody that's rehabbing, I think uh, set times, like where you're like, it has to be like, oh, I have specifically an hour. Now you can do that a hundred percent. Like I can do that, but I love the fact that a lot of the time my sessions might take a lot longer just because if I want to optimize something as much as possible, I, I know I might need to adjust something on the fly and I need a little bit more of a block of time to not only critically think, but implement something that might be a little bit longer of a day and like add in something else that I think might help optimize them at that day. So you have your, you have your plan, et cetera, but then trying to incorporate a lot more. So that means like maybe some more warm up sets, 
maybe some some different things before they're actually getting to true working sets so their overall volume and like their metabolic load is probably pretty damn high uh mm -hmm. but it's you know there's something that i've found that um uh, like it's it's been successful so far and like throughout my career of I've kind of kept sound principles towards the criterion based approach, like for sure. I've never really like liked timelines as much. Now, I think that it's just objective support to try to give you, okay, yeah, this might be another three weeks away. This might be another three months away, whatever that might be, but it's a lot more support to actually say that this person has adequately strained for uh, that next step or for clearance or whatever it might be. Sure. Okay, I've got a number of questions now that are coming up to to the surface. One of them involves, you know, cardiovascular conditioning, aerobic uh, selection. I guess uh, obviously you're dealing with NBA players that get a tremendous amount of court time running. So when you're getting them back into a conditioning phase, are you? I know it may depend upon what you're dealing with and bringing them back into it. So uh, do you get them into the water? to take the load off and do swimming do you are there some go-to pieces of equipment whether it be jacob's ladder the treadmill the rower the the air attack the air assault bikes or or what are your go-to's uh slide board like are, are there some that you're like okay we let's put this guy here he's had some ankle inversion he's got some ligamentous kind of stuff going down in that lower extremity i don't want to do a whole bunch of impact stuff so i'm just going to put him on the bike or put him in the pool i mean how do you how do you work that yeah i mean i think trying to obviously it's, it depends by each case and every just about every piece of equipment you said there are definitely viable options for 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 pieces of uh equipment to use from the get um so a lot of the time especially when there is an injury you try to think about what you can go ahead and optimize right around it. What's not going to may maybe put as much stress on that tissue. So yeah, it might be literally like a salt bike with just arms. If there's a significant leg injury or there might be, maybe they can use that leg, whatever it might be. Um, definitely getting them into a, a modified gravity, um, uh, like tool, such as a pool, uh, maybe completely non-weight bearing with swimming, but then, uh, like I've, Throughout my entire career, I've always loved the Alter G. Uh, if I have access to that, like that is a huge piece for any type of lower extremity injury. Mm -hmm. And then it allows you to go ahead and really objectively get it to where you are able to see what what is uh, like what the person can tolerate and play with the speeds, get up to a true, a true solid like workout on the Alter G because it is a very uh, very thorough tool to like assess how much body weight that person is actually going to get to or how much they're experiencing um, and mitigating a lot of unnecessary load at that time. So throughout any rehab process, specifically with the lower extremity, um, I'm usually going to use that at some point for, for my whole entire career. I've always done that just to try to see if I have it available. Now, if I don't have it available, then I might start on like an incline walk series and then also complementing it with different like assault bikes, uh, assault bike workouts, it depends. Um, but yeah, so I would say, uh, yeah, literally every tool that you just said, Versa climbers, all of that, you know, it's yeah. some, just to try to make sure that they're getting work, but not making, not making too much of a stressful environment for that injured area. And do you guys use power plates, whole body vibration? Uh, yeah. Yeah, everybody does. You do? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, yeah not not a tremendous amount, but just enough. Yeah, I, I use it some. I use it some, not I, not a lot. I did a couple years ago, but not, I haven't been using it as much, honestly. Myself. Just because you've got more stuff at your disposal now, or you just felt yeah, like, yeah. Ah, it wasn't giving me the biggest bang for my buck? Uh, No, yeah, it wasn't anything with the bang for the buck. Honestly, it was just... uh. Yeah, I just kind of moved the, moved away from it for a little bit. Like, I mean, I still use it intermittently, but I, I used to use it even more, even more so. I would use it with uh, joint mobilizations a lot more. Um, like, even just trying to get guys to get in, like, in better range, uh, et cetera, like, whatever it might be. But honestly, I think it was just, uh, I think it's just kind of like it used to be in my face every day. Uh -huh. Like, 
Yeah. Where like when I was working, and that was it. But it was like right in front of me when I was at work in two other places that I was at. So that's probably why. Okay. So earlier you mentioned kind of like joint by joints, uh, more or less approach uh, on doing some certain things. And I'm kind of curious, like, do you, in your approach with your eyes or, co you know, your, your whole kind of um, intrinsic protocol, are you looking from one plane to the next? Let's just take squat mechanics. We're looking to see how well the ankles, dorsiflexing, knee flexing, hip flexing, anterior tilt the pelvis, spinal extension, so on. You're working your way up and where there is a reduction of ideal motion, there's going to be a surplus somewhere else on the chain. Are you looking that way? And are you also, there's going to be a multi questions here. Are you tweaking it in the frontal and transverse plane? Are you just doing multi planar? Like, how do you view movement i guess that's my ultimate question when you're watching somebody move what are you looking for yeah i think that's a that's an excellent question uh it's definitely loaded because i would say that i i probably have a tendency to go more from the ground up um but not that i'm just strictly looking at that you know i might get uh i might say that that i'll i'll probably get biased towards that just from because i i definitely like to look at I mean, from the big toe all the way through the through the ankle and then seeing how it is going to affect each and every single plane. Um, I would say from a progression standpoint, a lot of the time I'll get biased to where if I am going to progress somebody in certain things, I'm going to try to really make sure that I'm attacking each phase or each plane kind of at one one plane at a time before I get into multiplanar movements for sure. That's my, my rationale on certain things, unless it's something that might not be at all dangerous. But let's say if I'm dealing with a knee or an ankle, I want to see how their body's going to respond to more of a loaded or dynamic or uh, honestly, a more rigorous exercise series in the sagittal plane first. And then looking at a couple different things to try how I would prep them for those different ground reaction forces in that. You know, so then when I'm thinking about running, though, uh, I absolutely try to not to to negate uh, the medial lateral forces as well as honestly, like just in the the transverse plane of how the knees hitting, etc. All of that stuff. So it might just be like you know inline running, but you also got to try to look at how it's actually affecting the entire kinematic chain, and from the medial lateral aspect to the overall honestly strike and absorption through like the actual transverse and like if there's significant valgus whatever it might be um i would say i i think that i recognize like off of uh the way that somebody kind of goes through a dynamic warm-up a lot of the time how they're what some restrictions might be um because a lot of the time i'm going to be doing multi-planar uh very dynamic like movements to try to just see how they are going to do it. Like I'm going to see, I'm going to incorporate a bunch of stuff in sagittal frontal and transverse plane throughout and in different like intensities and for, for different times. And it'll cause probably a, like a need for some verbal cueing, but then I also kind of let them move and see what I might want to try to optimize and then how that might actually affect while I also look them, look at them from what is actually on the table or, from a, a joint by joint like assessment and kind of complements each other when when they start to truly move. Uh, definitely yeah, looking at I could see probably I would I would guess and I could be wrong that you use a variety of multiplanar variations to a simple jumping jack where jumping jacks are primarily frontal plane, but hey, let's get one foot in front of the other and go through the sagittal plane, but let's go internal or external with the ankles, kind of like the Gray Institute and how they tweak all those different foot positions because that's going to give you so many joints positions at the hip, the ankle, the knee, the, 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 the foot complex, everything. Do you do something along that line with your dynamic movements, your warm-ups? Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um... It, literally what what you're talking about uh there's different like hop series stuff like that it depends yeah. if i'm just warming somebody up i want to see how they're moving yeah i might go take them through different rudiment hop series and then just different twists uh how somebody would move backwards how somebody would actually move like posterior lateral just moving around in different planes to try to see how that actual foot strike would 
would look and then how it transfers up the hip and see if I can recognize some type of repetitive uh, like compensatory strategy and then try to think why. And if that actually is something that needs to get addressed, because obviously a lot of compensation might not need to be necessarily addressed as much as what people think, you know? Oh man, you're so sexy talking dirty to me like that. I love that <laughs> stuff. That's awesome. So, okay. How about this? Riddle me this, Batman. With the amount of inversion sprains occurring primarily from landing on an opponent's foot when coming down from a rebound or a dunk, uh, how do you how do you bulletproof the the player's lower extremities for that? Are you doing say squats on an uneven surface like? How are you getting them to load in an inverted position in their rear foot so the proprioceptors fire, the tissue knows how to respond and all that? Or are you doing that? Are you avoiding it? Like, how do you bulletproof the lower extremities? Yeah, man. I mean, that's, that's you, you, you're the guru on this stuff. You're, you're the I, know. I want to hear your answer. Come on now. But no, in all honesty, I would say, um, there's a lot of different ways that that I like to to go ahead and approach this. And this is probably this is not even just with with basketball or anything like that. That's just like in general, if you're playing, if you're in 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 athletics in general, I don't think a lot of this stuff could hurt anybody. You know, I think that somebody should be on some type of uh, like uneven or uh, surface that would be considered, you know, not necessarily uh, flat uh definitely working me personally i like to go ahead and work on a lot of uh floating heel exercises but floating heel to where they're actually going to be loading through like a big toe more loading through the lateral toe while you're also getting certain things kind of incorporated with their with their torso their upper body trying to play with uh, a little bit more of a, a load on like one side like an asymmetrical loaded approach with a couple different movements is probably going to go very far. I feel like when you have to try to balance with your foot, uh, personally, I put a lot of people to move like in a weight room or something barefoot a lot of the time. Um, not that, not that there's anything wrong with working out in shoes, but a lot of time I want to see how that actual foot's going to respond. And then obviously you have to get them prepped by a lot of other dynamic movement and loads in a shoe. But I personally like to go ahead and go barefoot for a lot of it um and what are your red flags when they're in the in uh bare feet and training what is it that you're looking for so i get i get hyper focused on the big toe more than anything i would say and then i would say um like there's some tailor joint like kind of just to see how how much of a how much of a valgus i am seeing with certain movements um like when somebody is getting into a deeper closed chain position how much like what is it doing to the subtalar joint and uh is this something that i think that there's going to be enough of a restriction that would merit uh like a serious red flag um obviously i think that like people people have different anatomies across the board you know and like there's going to be a need to try to consider somebody a lot more of a high risk but uh or not and i think that people where i get kind of caught up with is looking at like asymmetries across the feet, like how it's going to look at, uh, how it looks for, let's say, close chain dorsiflexion, as well as like toe extension across like both feet. And if there's a big asymmetry, then that's where my biggest red flag is probably going to be. Just because yeah. I, I want to know why. And if there's something that that's causing up the chain that could be a significant problem. So those are probably... Yeah, do your sure. PTs or your ATs, who deals with the soft tissue? Or do you do it directly? Or do you uh, just say, hey, you know what? I, I need you to work on his dorsiflexion. That MTPJ is just not moving the way we want it to. I think it's a collective effort across the board. Yeah, so like ATs, PTs, uh, a lot of strength coaches as well. Like in the sense of like people might be uh, doing different flossing series for a guy that, that needs, uh, like that has significant like joint restrictions across the board, whatever it might be, uh, loaded mobilizations, and just making sure that the person, the athlete, uh, throughout, throughout my entire career, I've always thought that if the athlete understands why you're doing it, you're going to get a lot more buy-in, and they're going to take a little bit more of a, a responsibility in their own like injury prevention and recovery 
because they're understanding the why and not just like, all right, yeah, you got to do this. So go ahead and like, no, this is why it, this toe isn't moving right. And that can go ahead and have an effect on bump, 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 bump. You look at this toe that doesn't have that or whatever it might be, you know, hey, this knee, like this is a little bit more locked up. So just trying to explain to the athlete in general on why you might want to go ahead and, and change that up or like start to implement something is I think going to give you a lot more bang for your buck. Yeah, I could see you probably having them run on the court or go up and, and make a shot. And then, okay, come on over here. We're going to work on that foot a little bit, get this moving. Okay, now go ahead and do it again. Let's see if you know a difference. Oh, man, I'm flying off the ground now. Wow, I, I had no idea I had so much power. Uh, do, you, do you find that happening? Do you do that at all? Yes. That's direct buy-in. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, okay. So enough about the feet. I could go on for days, as you know, but – Let's talk about sports science because you are, you're in the deep. What is the difference, if any? What are the main um, compare and contrast sports science in the NFL and the NBA? Go. Yep. So I think there's a lot of similarities. Um, sports science in the NFL, remember, it's, there is a GPS system outside. So like what, mm. it's just a, it's a different, different dynamic in that regard. So everything's indoors. So there's just different systems across the board from the NBA, et cetera. Um, different, but very similar data points, what you're going to be trying to look for. Uh, and in my eyes, I still think that it's, there's just a lot of sound principles that somebody's going to be using from like load management, et cetera. But also now the other tools such as like force plates, that's not going to be very different in my, in my eyes uh, from like this, the aspect that you're going to be able to try to, to work on mitigating injuries from a lot of different ways. And the, the tools that you use are not always going to be necessarily so specific for your sport. Like you're going to be looking for asymmetries, no matter what you're going to be looking for spikes, no matter what I think with, uh, with basketball, uh, because there's so many more games, there's just a lot more tracking in that regard towards like actual games. Like there's much more tracking because there's 82 games and you're able to go ahead and see what a person was and trends a lot easier as opposed to just for 17 games or 15 games. Now people use that, like obviously there's practice, there's all of this stuff, but for game plays, I think that like the, uh, the NBA probably has just, a very, very large amount of uh, uh, data points that they're able to look at. So that's, that's one of the points I'll say. And in terms of like the GPS and noticing fatigue, peak uh, peak performance, shall we say, uh, does, does that filter upward to the coaching staff? Because I can imagine the coaches have been doing this for years and they can tell when they need to give a player a rest. And when they are not going to call time out, they're going to let them run with it. But how much sports science, um, and I know you can't speak for the coaching staff itself, but yeah, yeah. Is, what's, what's the interplay? Like, do you, do you have a lot of conversations with the coaching staff in, in regards to GPS and sports science? Uh, so yeah. that, to a certain degree, to a certain degree, yeah. but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, there's so many different moving parts to that, that yeah. like there's, there's definitely a, an interplay between both, between both departments and everything. So we like not both departments, I mean like coaching and they always listen to if, if we have a suggestion about certain things, but it's not necessarily mandated by any type of uh, decision based off, off of uh, load management or sports science. And honestly, I, that one, I can't like go too far into detail about stuff. But No yeah. problem. All right, let's switch gears then. Summer League, it's coming up. It's right around the corner. It's yeah. going to be kicking off. Uh, it was in. Is it still in Vegas this year? I know it's going to be probably in several cities. Where, where are the yeah. Heat playing the Summer League? So they're uh, in Sacramento to start. And then, uh, uh, yeah, and then they go to uh, Vegas right after. Yes, sir. Nice. Are you traveling with them? uh i'm traveling for parts of it for parts of it yeah all right you gotta let me know when you're coming out the west we're gonna connect right. sacramento's 
my in-laws live there. Actually, my buddy is the team doctor for the Kings and oh, we yeah? surf together. Yeah, we surf kind of regularly. I don't know if you know uh, Johnny Greenfield. He's shy. He won't get on this podcast. I'm, I'm on him. He's like, give me time. Give me time. But eventually, you know who I did have on here recently was Russ Rausch. Yeah, yeah. Russ That's... is a pretty cool guy. He works with you. He's one of the uh, mental skills guys. Oh, yeah. yeah. Amazing. I love Russ. Yeah. So, okay. With that, I guess we'll, we'll be finishing up here in a minute or two, but um, the, the different roles or departments that you're working with, what are the ones that, you, that intrigue you more, shall we say? The, um, are there those that you're like, oh, that's cool. I want to learn more about it. Whether it's uh, performance nutrition, whether it's mental skills coaching, whether it's uh, sleep experts is is there anything that kind of like I I would love to kind of sit in that room for a while with those guys yeah so I would probably say um, like and you're not talking about somebody that's on the team correctly right and currently right now you're talking about in general or just in general yeah but yeah, yeah without naming names or anything yeah so I mean mental performance uh, skills I would probably say is something that is that's uh like the fact that if you're actually able to go really and uh, tap into somebody's ability to, for them to be like operating at a higher level just through more tactics and conversations and techniques, I think that that's something that transfers to to anybody, even past athletics. So yeah, that's always been extremely intriguing to me, and uh, having having individuals that like Russ that she just talked about, yeah, like, that's that's amazing. Um, but yeah, that's probably the one, the one area that I would say is like the most intriguing to me because I had a psychology background, but uh, I definitely uh, find that it can be extremely impactful too, because all the other sciences obviously are extremely effective, but that one is just, there's, there's something about it that if somebody is dialed in, I feel like, you know, mentally there's, they, they almost have an unfair competitive advantage. So, you know, I'm not surprised you answered it that way, because just looking at your track record and uh, goal setting, goal attainment and, and watching your career path, it's it's no wonder that uh, because that's that's a big part of it is the mental game. And, and you've got you've got the A game going on, brother. I can't believe there. You know, I get some guests on here and I got a hunt for questions and I keep I look at the clock and I'm not going to mention anybody in the past, but every now and then I'm like, Oh boy, this is this is kind of a long, a long conversation. Let's feel this thing flew by. I can't believe we're already here at the end. Um, I I'm so stoked for you. I can't I can't tell you how uh, excited, proud, and all that that you're you're living uh you're you're living a life with a, a new family and a great opportunity right around hometown Miami. And uh, and I really do. I want to connect with you when you guys come out to Sacramento. I'll take a drive up. It's not that far away. We'll go out for lunch or something if if time permits or whatever. Absolutely. Where are you right now? Where you're Santa Cruz. I'm okay. right on the coast. Yeah. So uh an hour south of San Francisco. We're two hours and fifteen minutes from my in-laws' house right in Sac. So I got a I got a place to stay and uh the, the new arena is gorgeous. So I don't know if you've been to the Kings Arena or not. It's yeah. uh you yeah, must have been last season to some yeah, yeah thank so you. I'll, I'll definitely we'll connect for sure when I'm out there. Yeah, all right. So uh, if people want to follow you, of course they can go to LinkedIn. Do you got an Instagram handle? I do. Um, I'm not as active as I probably should be, but it's uh, Jeff underscore Ruiz O three. O three. Perfect. I'll put them in the description below. Jeff, this has been awesome, man. I really I can't thank you enough for putting a little time aside so we can catch up. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. For real, it was it was a pleasure, and it's it's always great talking to you. And uh, look forward to speaking to you soon. For sure. Right on, man. And that's a wrap for this episode of the Zealous Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I do. I want to thank Jeff for coming on, as well as the Miami Heat organization for letting this happen. Go to NSCA.com today. Cast your vote for all the things on this year's ballot. You've got till Jan- July 12th. July 12th. And don't forget, there's a place to go for CEUs. Just go to RockySnyder.com. Check out SatantaCollege.com online for your master's degree in science. 10% off tuition by entering RS10. 
And I guess that's it. We'll see you next week.